worthy of it all.
Let's just stir the waters of baptism. You know, there's nothing quite like the act of baptism. It represents you coming from one season of living one way into another. It represents resurrection. It represents going under and coming up. Jesus knew that for him to fulfill his purpose, he had to be baptized. So it represents fulfillment. So we, we just want to experience uh, that this morning as a body. And we want to experience the act, but not only the act, but the meaning of it. It also represents the cleansing of conscience. Peter says sometimes it's important for you to be baptized to clear your conscience and wash away the last season. So let's just stir these waters of baptism. as the water rises up and goes into every cell to wash out what needs to be washed out. Let's sing this. Let's thank God for what he's doing. Oh, I am new and oh, I am fresh in you, yeah. As your
Kathleen is friends of Ann, and her husband's here. They're connected with us. They're from Arizona. And Kathleen, this is a time I'm assuming that you have said, I want to just redevote my whole life to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience his kingdom in a way I've never experienced it before. And so with that, we come and Anne is going to baptize her, her husband, her son's out there. We baptize you, Kathleen, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. In the name of the... It's all new. By the power of God... By the name of Jesus, and we say, let Holy Spirit now fill her, open the heavens over her in a new way. Let's thank God for what he's doing. Then we have Gabriel Clift. Lord, we thank you for this family that's coming into a new place. We thank you for the freedom they're experiencing. Father, we thank you that this is a new beginning. Lord, and we thank you that old things go down and new things begin to spring forth. So in the name of the Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of his Spirit, we decree Gabriel is rising in a new way in Jesus' name. Let's give a shout of victory. Gabe, Gabe, I heard the Lord say when you went under that water, he said, no, that by your name that there will always be angels attending you. Keep your eyes open, the Lord said, I'll always have them there. Gabriel has the same birthday as Donnie did. So, Lord, we say a new generation to carry on, to be empowered, to move forward. Now, let's worship.
about the love of God. Richard, you and Andrea, come up for a minute. Richard came to me one night at the Bolano and he said that for the first time, he's going to meet his family and meet his father for the first time in North Dakota. It's, it's quite amazing when God decides to redeem time and restore. Richard, share with us just for a moment. Uh, about uh, two years ago in September, I had a dream about my uh, grandfather who I never met. And uh, it was a, he would show me how to drive a car. And uh, my dad was in it, me and my uncle. And uh, so I talked to my wife and uh, I called my dad next day and he was, uh, what? What are you talking about? He was kind of freaking out a little bit. And uh, I told him what was going on. He said, if he's alive, he's, uh, he'll be 85 years old and his name is Al Grubb. And so we went searching and um, I found an Al Grubb in North Dakota who lived in Ohio about the same time. And I uh, got my wife and I wrote a letter and I just told him, you know, if this is you, I'd like to know who you are. And if it isn't, it's no problem at all. And so, was it in uh, November, we uh, got a call from uh, the brother-in-law, and he uh, said, yeah, we got the letter. He wasn't going to do anything, but uh, his wife, his daughter said, we want to know our uh, brother. And uh, so, we kept communicating, communicating and stuff, and then this July, uh, July 4th actually, my dad went to go visit him. And uh, some things happened there, and I had called, and I didn't know he was going there. And uh, I actually got to talk to him about two weeks ago, my grandfather, and uh, everything worked out, and we're going to go Wednesday and visit. Now, just think about that. Three generations that have never connected in a bloodline. And see, what God will do is choose one in that bloodline. And because God's not in time, he'll just go back and redeem the whole bloodline. So, Father, we send Richard up there and we say this is a time of redeeming the time. We say he's going to see how to make decrees that things that have never been aligned properly will be aligned properly. We say, Lord, this is going to break open even the next generation and break iniquities off the next generation. So, Father, we send him and we say his grandfather will receive him and favor him in a new way. Let's thank God for what he's doing. Let's sing it one more time. Maggie, just sing it over us. He loves us. Extend your hands to her. Sarah's going to Loveland, Colorado. She's going to minister to the healing room ministries there. And then she's going to meet uh, her, meet birth family members as well. God's doing something in this to redeem the time. Everybody say redeem the time. Something will go on this week in your life that will redeem lost time from other seasons. Father, we send Sarah with healing to stir in her hands, but with healing to rise up in her blood. Father, we thank you for how we are sending forth, and this week we will see the redeeming of times. Let's sing it one more time.
I've just welcomed Linda Heidler to come and talk to us about bringing forth what we need to bring forth. Lord, we thank you and we bless you for what you're doing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now bless somebody around you and let's just enter in. Thank you, Chuck, very much. Um, Robert usually does this for me. Okay, are we are we connected? Can we go ahead and put it up? Yes, thank you very much. Um, today I want to talk about uh, one way of expressing intercession, and it's through weeping, wailing, and travailing. And um, last Sunday during the 7.30 service, Tobias released a, a message in tongues. And as soon as he started that message, uh, my spirit became so stirred and I just, I felt like every cell in my body was vibrating and all I had was just this sound. It was just, I didn't have a, an interpretation of the tongue, I didn't have the words, so I didn't know quite what to do with it. All I had was this sound. And so I didn't go forward with it as uh, interpretation. But then as Robert was speaking, that sensation did not go away. And so at the end of that time, Chuck said, now go to somebody and tell them how you're feeling. And I went to Susan Shawless. I said, I feel like I'm about to explode. I don't know what this is. And she said, I feel the same way. And I thought, okay, this is not just me. This is something that's going on corporately and it needs to be expressed. So that was when I went forward. And I mean, I don't even know what I said. I just knew I have got to release this. And uh, that sound came out of me. And um, so that was an expression of intercession when, when that happens. And uh, so Chuck asked me if I would speak on that this morning. He said, I think a lot of people don't understand how that works, how weeping, wailing, and travailing works and what it does. So that's... Um, what I'm going to do. And as Linda's preparing to speak, remember now what we're discussing in this early service is the expression of the Spirit. And you're going to find this expression over in uh, Romans chapter 8. There's three ways that we pray. We can pray with words that we know. We can pray with words that we don't understand. That's called praying in the Spirit and tongues. And then there's another form of praying that you just got to let out whatever's rising up. <laughs> and that's what today is. There are certain things that will not break through till yeah. we get this. Yeah. Yeah. So a definition of intercession is the activity of receiving a burden or assignment from the Lord and standing in the position that he puts you in against the enemy until the enemy is overcome and you see the will of God accomplished. And that's, in a nutshell, what you do in intercession. But there are lots of ways of expressing that. There are lots of ways that that works out. But three of these expressions are weeping, wailing, and travailing. So let's start with weeping. The dictionary definition is to shed tears because of sadness, pain, or rage, to shed tears as an expression of emotion, to express grief or anguish, to lament, to mourn, or to grieve. And when I looked up these, uh, the word for words for weeping in the Old Testament, most of them are about repenting and turning back to the Lord. Um, it talks about fasting and weeping um, and uh, beating your breast and weeping before the Lord. 
And Joel is one of the most interesting passages about weeping intercession. And here's what it says. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. And who knows whether or not he will relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? So then the Lord will be zealous for his people and the land. He will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say, Behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, and oil. You will be satisfied in full with them, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. So in this passage, Israel had gotten in a bad place, and the army was invading, and, and they talk about it like the, the locusts. There's nothing that can stop them. They come over the wall. They run through the city. And um, the Lord said, if you will come together and weep as an indication that you are rending your hearts, not just your garments, as, if you will do that as an expression of your repenting, and if the priests then will position themselves between the, the altar of sacrifice and the porch of the temple and weep and call on God to save you, then I'll answer. And this place where the, position, the priests were positioned between God and the people that's the place of intercession. The intercessor always stands between God and whatever's going on on the earth. So he was calling them to come into that place and weep. And that was call out to God for mercy on the land and the people. That was their expression of intercession. Now, there are two Greek words translated as weep. One simply means weep. It, and it's used of general sorrow, loss, death, anything. The other one means to wail and lament, and it describes the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and it expresses pain and regret. And what I saw in this is you can either weep in repentance or you can weep where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because it's too late to repent at that point. And I'd rather choose the first one of repentance. So weeping is most often an expression of sorrow of the soul, but it can also be an expression of prayer and repentance, and it can also be an expression of intercession if God calls you to position yourself in a place of weeping. And then uh, wailing is a little different. The dictionary definition of wail is to lament, to moan, loud weeping, lamentation, emitting a long, loud cry, or crying weakly and softly. The Hebrew words for wail all indicate a loud lamentation and mourning. Um, other words that are associated with wailing or howling, moaning, crying aloud, and both the Greek and the Hebrew words indicate also beating your breast in grief. One of the most interesting passages about wailing is in Jeremiah 9, uh, it's 17 and 18. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for the wailing women. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may shed tears and our eyelids flow with water. For a voice of wailing is heard from Zion. Now hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor a dirge. 
Now, this is a peculiar passage talking about women who come and the reason you call them is to release this sound. And there are some words used to describe these women. One word is coon, and it indicates the sound. There is a specific sound that they release when they wail. And the second word is chakam, and it's from the root word of wisdom and our skill in living. They were skilled at what they did. They knew how to do what they were doing. It was purposeful. And the third word is nehi, and it means a lamentation. So these were women who were skilled in lamenting. They were skilled in releasing a specific sound. They would hear the word of the Lord, and they were skilled in releasing it with the sound which would cause the nation to grieve over their condition. That's what it said. Call for them that our eyes may flow with tears. So there was something about the sound that they released that provoked the nation to grieve over, over their condition. And they were, the, perp, the reason they were called was to help the nation to wail. Now, it's important to grieve because sometimes our soul can't be healed unless we grieve, if we don't express our grief. But it's also important to express grief because there is a sound of wailing that reaches God. And that's what this is doing. These women knew how to cause that sound to be released corporately. Their sounds and their words could touch people's and open their hearts in such a way that God would hear their cry. And there are sounds that get the attention of God. When Israel was in Egypt, God heard their cry. There was a sound they released, and it said it, it went up to God. When Jesus was going in Jer to Jerusalem, and blind Bartimaeus stood up and started calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus heard his cry, and he healed him. And there is a sound of corporate wailing that reaches the heart of God and prompts him to respond. And sometimes when one person releases their sound, it causes others to release their sound. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 9, it was a sound of wailing. That was the sound that was called for. But there can be a sound of deliverance. Somebody can give a testimony of deliverance, and it can begin to unlock people all over, all over the room. It can be a sound of worship. There can be a sound that comes out that suddenly you just find yourself rising in worship. Um, I had an experience of this that I will never forget. I had had a particularly bad day at the office, grueling day. And the next morning, getting ready to go in, I just thought, I don't know how I'm going to make it through today. I had not completely worked through all the issues of the day before. And that particular day, Robert had um, an early appointment. So we drove through somewhere and got something to eat. And he went to his appointment, and I went out to Solomon's porch. And I thought, I'm just going to sit here, look at the garden, and maybe get settled. And so I started to eat my breakfast, and I thought, what I really want to do, I just want to walk through the garden and worship. And somehow it was like my thoughts were still so scattered, and my emotions were still so stirred up. I couldn't quite focus to do that. And then I saw James Vincent come in. And I thought, oh my, if James would just walk around the garden one time and he would worship, I think I could worship. And so I went and said, James, would you mind just walking with me and worshiping as we walk? He said, sure, yeah, <laughs> no problem for him to worship. So we began to walk and he began to sing and I began to weep, and then I began to worship, and then my heart was settled. I, it unlocked something in me that needed, that was what needed to happen for me to focus and be able to go on with what I needed to do that day. He had a sound 
that did something in me. And sometimes one or a few may be anointed to release that sound, but it will multiply as many others are unlocked. It's an unlocking sound to, to release your sound also. And that's part of the breaker anointing. Sometimes, you know, you know you're just not breaking through yet, and somebody will have a word, a song, a, decla a declaration, and you feel it break. That is... That's that anointing. And that's what I did last Sunday. There was a cry in me of desperation for Holy Spirit to come. And many others felt that. I have gotten emails. I have gotten phone calls from people that weren't even here that said, I was watching on the web, and when you released that sound, I went out on the floor and began to wail and weep. To God for a move of the Spirit. When I released my sound, many others were unlocked. And when we released our sound corporately during the Triumphant Faith Institute last week, Holy Spirit came during the second service. I mean, that was incredible the way we just ascended in worship. Um, and that was the breakthrough sound that needed to come. Now for travail. The dictionary definition of travail is concluding the concluding state of pregnancy from the onset of contractions to the birth of the child. It's the use of physical or mental energy, hard work, especially when arduous or involving painful effort. Tribulation or agony or anguish. Now, if you have ever had a baby, you know what this is. It's the beginning of contractions till the birth of the child. It is focused. It is painful. It is laborious. But you get a baby at the end of it. And so women keep doing it. The Hebrew words for travail all indicate being in a state of distress, whether it's from pain, fear, grief, sorrow, or childbirth. They also indicate labor or toil, which is a wearing effort on the body or the mind. Isaiah 53 describes the anguish of the soul of the Messiah. It says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death, he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The word that it used for the anguish of his soul can also be translated as travail because of the travail of his soul. And it's said to be part of his intercession. And what he birthed was the salvation of the world through his intercession. Now, the actual word travail is not used in the New Testament. If you, if you type it in on a word search, it will pull up zero matches. But there are several words which include the concept of travail. Almost all of them have to do with childbirth. Uh, one of them is the Greek word odino, and it means to suffer pain in childbirth. I love the second one. It's the Greek word tikto, and it means to produce from seed. As a mother, a plant, the earth literal or figurative, to bear, be born, bring forth, be delivered, be in travail. This is the word used for Mary when she brought forth her son Jesus. I love this because it begins with a seed. There's something God plants and it comes to fullness and then there's a time when it needs to be birthed. And it's the it's the root of the Greek word that's translated intercede. So bringing forth and intercession just go hand in hand. And this ties directly back to Isaiah 53, where Jesus travailed in intercession to birth salvation and redemption for the world. Travail always brings something to birth. If you, if you travail and travail and travail, 
and nothing ever comes to birth, you need to ask God what's going on because you should see some fruit. Now, remember what she just said because when Jesus was travailing in Gethsemane, here's another way of looking at it. Seeds were being spread through the entire earth realm. And see, those seeds are in us, so there's going to be times that you have to do the same thing as he did to bring forth what he deposited for redemption then. And so it's a redeeming quality of bringing forth what is time now to sprout. So we can think of these expressions of intercession like this. Weeping brings repentance, and it restores our intimacy with God. When intimacy is restored, conception can occur. He can plant that seed when we return, when we weep. Wailing brings breakthrough. It's like when when a woman's water breaks. You know the time has come, the season has come, And there's a sound of that wail that brings that. Travail brings birth. What you have interceded for comes into being. You know it's time for it to come. Now, last week, what I released was a wail. It unlocked the sound in many others. It was a breakthrough sound. And this caused God to respond, and we had an amazing presence of the Holy Spirit. But this didn't bring to birth the move of God that we've been crying out for. It was as if the water broke, but now we need to move from wailing to travailing to see the full move of the Holy Spirit that we've been crying out for since last year when we started the 515, crying out for God for the kind of miracles that occurred in Acts 5.15. We haven't seen that birthed yet, but the water has broken. Now, we've not been this way before, and I can't stand up here and tell you the five steps of effective travail. And I can't tell you the seven points that you need to know to bring it to birth. I do know that we need to keep seeking the Lord for how this needs to come about and go with whatever he brings to us. And he has brought us this far and he will take us through to the ultimate fulfillment. Now think about Israel in Egypt. God said, I'm going to bring you out. There was a process of power confrontations that had to take place. They went through hard labor. It was, uh, there was a lot of anxiety of soul in that before they could be birthed through the Red Sea and, and become a new nation. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, earthquakes, famines, and wars are the beginning of birth pangs. Now, what do we see around us? Now, when a woman is in travail, she's got to stay focused on what she's doing. She has got to stay focused on bringing that baby to birth. Now, we're at a point of travail, and we need to be focused on what God has promised us until we get through the whole process and we see that full move of God birthed in the earth. And Lord, let it be here first. Amen. That this is so necessary for us to get because, you know, you could see last week there had to be something to shift us. Now, it's going to happen in all of us. Uh, uh, Men need to understand the power of travail. Uh, And you might express it differently. Uh, All of us are going to express travail differently. Uh, another thing about travail that is so important is let's take Hannah. Uh, Hannah had to bring forth. She had to travail. There was no, even no sound that came out of her. Her travail was so deep there was no sound. And it caused uh, Eli, it caused an ungodly priest to recognize this is God. And uh, the thing about birthing and travail, 
you it, it's not one of those things it's like it, it's a little same way you have to treat it if it's public there has to be some sort of expression or else it's just confusing. It'd be like a woman having a baby right here in the middle of us. But like last week, that's why it was so important because we could interpret where Linda was based upon the prophetic word. Now, of course, last week, it became a real experience with us by Thursday with uh, Celestine travailing, but she had a very hard labor. Uh, for it started at noon on Wednesday and lasted till uh, uh, 6.30 that morning, uh, Thursday morning. So it was a very hard labor. Uh, and notice you have to have people to help you sometimes. Her mother, Pam, uh, the doctor had to help her. Isaac had to help her bring forth. So see, sometimes God's going to put you in with people that will help you to bring forth what is necessary for you to bring forth because you might not even understand what it's going to take. And the Linda used one word, you can lose focus very easily in travail. Now I'm going to say that again. You can lose focus very easily in the midst of travail and then you can have the baby ready to be brought to birth and it can't come. That's why we have to also add the concept of focus to travail. Focus is where, here's the easiest way to think about it, it's where you're taking a magnifying glass and remember you get it focused, uh, you get it in place with the sun coming down through it over a stack of leaves and eventually all of those light rays will focus through there and then the leaves will catch on fire. That's, that's the best way of understanding focus, bringing everything into one place to produce a catalyst action. Now here's another picture of travail, which will help you understand. Go ahead, guys, and show that. Uh, this will help you remember travail. If you will just look at the person next to you and say, you see that white towel, that's you. Every one of you are going to be washed sooner or later. Every one of us get washed. Now, and that's the easiest way of understanding travail. Once you're being washed, you're going to be stuck through that ringer. And uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. And... Uh, and as it's moving through, it's going to produce a lot of stuff coming out of you. That is the picture of travail. Now, there's one verse that I want to leave with you. It's Isaiah 54. Because it is, it's, uh, that, and that chapter of Joel is worth meditating on all week this week. It's just a wonderful chapter. Uh, but Isaiah 54 is, uh, when you look at it in context, what's happening is the Lord has, it follows what Linda was talking about, which was a prophetic proclamation of what the Lord was going to do for us in Isaiah 53. And then you get to Isaiah 54 and it says, sing, O barren one. Now, I love this because barrenness uh, is something that has to break off of us. Sing, O barren one, you who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. Sing and travail. Notice what she said about she and James. There's the verse right there. Sing and travail. Sing and travail because you who did not travail with child. Just because you don't have children doesn't mean you're not going to travail. Because God's going to put something, if you're His, He's going to put something in you that He wants to bring forth. 
Now I'm going to say that again. There will be something that is in you that is unique that needs to be brought forth. Every one of us. And so it, say, it says, For the spiritual children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. So travail comes with singing for enlargement. And that comes in the midst of your testings. Because testing is linked with enlargement. So let's stand up because what God is saying and what he's doing. Now, when Linda travailed, all of a sudden something started breaking in that hard warfare that we had been in. And by Tuesday midnight, something had broken. And because uh, uh, the intensity of the last three weeks has been very dramatic and very... Uh, very just like the towel in the uh, in the picture, and all of a sudden by Tuesday night something broke. Even in the issue with the land, with the city, because God was saying you have to have that sort of sound coming up for me to acknowledge you. That's what it said in the Bible in Exodus three. Uh, they they came up, Exodus 2, they sent this sound up to heaven in Egypt. God acknowledged the sound and then remembered his covenant with them and started moving on their behalf. Now, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I decree that we will see a movement that comes out of the sound. We will see a movement out of the travails that are coming forth. We say in law Enlargement will occur because of this time of travail. We say new worship will arise because of this time of travail. Lord, we say that the barrenness will break, singing will come, and we will bring forth sons and daughters that we can't imagine to build the house of the future. Father, we thank you for the sounds in us that you will now start producing in Jesus' name. Let's give a shout. Now, before we take our break, pray over someone and say, you might be in a hard place, but this message is going to help you bring forth.